was you in my life More love, more power More you in my life And I worship you with all of my heart And I worship you with all of my mind And I worship you with all of my strength You are my Lord You are my Lord More love More love More power More you in my And I worship you with all of my heart And I worship you with all of my mind And I worship you with all of my strength You are my Lord You are my More faith. More faith. More passion. More you in my life. More faith. More passion. More you in my life. And I worship you with all of my heart. And I worship you with all of my mind And I worship you with all of my strength For you are my Lord You are my Lord You are my Lord You are my If you'd like, you can uh, sit down. This next song, it comes from uh, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, to God Almighty, both strength and glory. Worship the Lord in all his splendor, for he is holy again. Ascribe to the Lord, to God Almighty, both strength and glory. Worship the Lord in all his splendor, for he is holy. And I wasn't there when he walked on the water, calmed the raging sea. And I wasn't there when he died on the cross, but I know he's living in me. I know he's living in me. I know he's living in me. The voice, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars and the thunders over mighty seas. The Lord gives strength to all his people and he blesses his people with peace. The voice, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars and the thunders over mighty seas. The Lord gives strength to all his people and he blesses his people with peace. And I wasn't there when he walked on the water, calmed the raging sea. And I wasn't there when he died on the cross, but I know he's living in me. I know he's living in me. I know he's living in me. And I wasn't there when he walked on the water, calmed the raging sea. And I wasn't there when he died on the cross, but I know he's living in me. I know he's living in me I know he's living in me I know he's living in me I know he's living in me
to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In you, O God, I place my trust. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. My hope is in you. Show me your ways. Guide me in truth. In all my days, my hope is in you. I am, I am, O oh Lord, filled with your love. You are, O oh God, my salvation. Guard my life and rescue me. My broken spirit shouts, my mended heart cries out. My hope is in you. Show me your ways. Guide me in truth. And all my days, my hope is in you. To you, O oh Lord, to you, O oh Lord, I lift my soul. In you, O oh God, I place my trust. Do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me my hope is in you show me your way guide me in truth in all my days my hope is in you show me Guide me in truth In all my days My hope is you I am, O oh Lord Filled with your love You are, O oh God My salvation God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley, of death and dying I will not fear cause you with me you with me your shepherd's staff comforts me you are my feet in the presence of enemies Surely goodness will follow me, follow me, the house of God forever, the house of God forever. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting. I won't be wanting 
He makes me rest in fields green with quiet streams. Even though I walk through the valley of death and dying, I will not fear, cause you with me, you with me. The shepherd's staff comforts me, you are my feast in the presence of enemy. Surely goodness will follow me, follow me. House of God forever. House of God forever. The shepherd's staff comforts me. You are my beast in the presence of enemy. Surely goodness will follow me. House of God forever. House of God forever. House of God forever. Amen. Can somebody shut that door? Thank you. Those darn kids. <laughs> it's great. I love to hear them. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you're kind of cute. Okay, those for those watching who don't know, that's my wife, okay? <laughs> Gonna get emails and letters. <laughs> What 
a savior isn't he wonderful sing hallelujah Christ is risen bow down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord. Of Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Give as was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to. The altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Amen. If you would like to stand for this last song. I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. I see the Lord. I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple with
exalted and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory and the whole earth is filled and the whole earth is filled and the whole earth is filled with his glory holy Father in heaven, we just come before you. We just praise you. In reverence, we just submit to you this evening. I just pray that by your spirit that you continue just to move amongst us. I just pray for Pastor Kevin that you just anoint him, that he speaks your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated. Or turn around and say, Yeah, let's greet somebody. All right, if we can uh, start making our way back to our, our seats, we will begin with the Bible study. So, but before we actually get into the word, you know, it, it was, it dawned on me that um, the reason why we here at Calvary Chapel teach word for word, line by line, book by book, is because that way, as Paul said, we don't fail to give you the full counsel of God. And one of the things that happens when you constantly teach on, a topics, on topics or topical teaching is that you end up teaching on the things you like. And one thing that um, you know, we don't talk about here very often, and it was brought to my attention by Oh, I don't know. We won't say, but she has a birthday today. Uh, when I saw her earlier in the office was, you guys never talk about the tithes and you never give people an opportunity to really give, um, you know, because we don't put a lot of emphasis in it because, well, for I know for me and Pastor Troy, it's kind of uncomfortable, right? You know, we, we don't want to be I've gone to churches, and I'm sure you have too, where the main message is give, 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 um, you know, and and they kind of suck you clean. But I I think sometimes we go to the opposite end, you know, whereas Pastor Troy and myself, we have no idea what anybody gives. We don't want to because we know God will provide. At the same time, a lot of times we don't even remind people that there's an opportunity and that biblically we should be giving. And so half the time we forget to pray for the tithes or, you know, just admit that there, um, you know, that there's the agape boxes so that we all can give back to the Lord. And so, you know, I know for me, I need to apologize because I don't do that often enough. But like I was saying, that's why we do teach verse by verse. So those subjects that are kind of uncomfortable, we make sure and and get. But all that just to say is, let's pray for the church's finances and, and the giving of its members. Lord, we come before you, and once again, um, I thank you that you give us the opportunity to give back a little bit of what you've blessed us with. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would bless all the finances that come here into the church, Lord, and ultimately, we know this is your church, and you'll provide. And so, God, we pray that um, you would give the leadership here wisdom on how best to Uh, spend what you've entrusted us with, Lord, uh, that it would just glorify you and and your gospel would go out. 
So God, we ask that you would bless the finances and those who give. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would, turn to your, in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. Um, you know, Jeremiah is really an a interesting guy. You know, the, um, he's been often called the weeping prophet because of, the, of his ministry. And, um, you know, in a lot of cases, he's the bearer of bad news to come, right? You know, what a great ministry that is. Oh, by the way, you're going into captivity. Oh, by the way, you know, there's some judgment coming upon you. You know, good times. You know, none of us like to be the bearer of bad of, uh, you know, uh, bad news or whatever, but that was, that's who Jeremiah is, and that's what most of this book is. But even through all of the, the messages that Jeremiah had to give to the nations and, and these prophecies that he gave, the one thing you'll see is that in and through it all, God is good, and there's hope, and and, you know, uh, God always provides that hope. And even in despair and in captivity, God is there. You know, and, and I love it. And it starts in the very beginning of the book. And, and we'll get into it in a, in a minute, just exactly how, uh, you know, God from before Jeremiah was even born, he ordained him to give this message. To, you know, that God ordained him before he was ever conceived in his mother's womb, uh, you know, for the ministry that God called him to. But you know what? It's not just Jeremiah, the prophet. It's each and every one of us. God knew each and every one of us before we were born. And he ordained each and every one of us with a plan and a purpose. As I've often said many times, if you have a pulse, God's not done with you. You know, otherwise, you know, God's not sadistic enough to leave us here on this earth, uh, you know, if he was through with us, right? No, it, it wants, God has a plan and a purpose, just like he did for Jeremiah, for each and every one of us. And he knew what that plan was from before we were ever conceived in our mother's womb. What an amazing thought that is. But before we get into some of that, um, you know, as, as we do these surveys, and especially through, uh, as we go through the major prophets, as they're called, you know, because they're large books, um, Jeremiah consists of 52 chapters, um, what we're going to do is just kind of give a real brief overview of how the book is structured, and then I'll get in just to, through uh, a couple of verses that I think has some practical application for us, you know, things that we can pull from certain verses in, in the book of Jeremiah. And hopefully all that we're, I'm really trying to do with these surveys is to create a hunger that you'll go back and read it more in depth, because obviously we're not going to cover the whole book of Jeremiah in depth in a matter of about 30 minutes. But it's more of like, look at some of the stuff that's in here and look how good it is. Yeah, it's Old Testament, and sometimes we forget how applicable the Old Testament is in our lives today, you know, living on this side of the cross. But wow, there's some great stuff in here, and, and hopefully we're able to draw some of that out tonight. But so, like I said, the book of Jeremiah is really broken into four sections, and the first section is, is really the call of Jeremiah, God's call upon his life. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And then the second section is the majority of the book of Jeremiah, and it's really the prophecies concerning Judah, and uh, it's the prophecies towards, um, you know, uh, all of the, uh, the uh, with Judah and the new covenant, and, and the fact that through all of this, through the through the thirty three from chapter two to forty five, we see a bunch of messages that that uh, Jeremiah predicts the future and he kind of gives warnings to, to Judah. Then the third section really addresses prophecies for other nations. You know, it's um, where he's talking about uh, nine different kingdoms and he concludes with uh, the judgment of Babylon. So we'll see that, you know, that's kind of in the third section. And then the final section uh, in Jeremiah 52 provides an account of the, the fall of Jerusalem. And so, you know, all of this is given and there's so much valuable information that not only 
we can glean from it, but the people of his day should have been able to glean from it. You know, that, that information that God was warning them about. And, and so as we get ready to get into the book of Jeremiah, let's ask God the, to bless it one more time and then we'll, we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these 66 love letters that you've given us. Lord, I thank you uh, that your son is in every book, Lord, that the volume of it was written about him, God. So, Lord, I pray that you would be with us tonight, that you would anoint this time that we have now as we look at your word. God, we just pray that you would bless it, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's start in chapter one here. It seems like a logical place to start, right? I mean, I don't know. Seems good to me. Um, Chapter one and in verse four, it says, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I love those verses and those verses are very powerful. Those verses are, you know, they're so applicable to a lot of the different things that we see here. You know, the first thing that I see here in verse four, it says, then the word of the Lord came to me. You know, it's the word of the Lord came to him. Jeremiah had a personal encounter with the Lord. You know, Jeremiah, when when he had that personal encounter with the Lord, the Lord became personal to him, didn't he? He was a young lad. He was young. And God's coming to him and saying, you know what, Jeremiah, not only am I, am I, are you having this personal encounter with me, but I am calling you to this ministry. I'm calling you for this specific ministry that I ordained before you were ever born. I knew you. I formed you in the womb. You know, what a, what a powerful thing that had to be to Jeremiah. You know, how intimidating would that be? You know, that, that the Lord, uh, you know, had, he had this personal encounter with the Lord. He was saying, Jeremiah, I got a special purpose for you. And I, I've been working on this purpose before you were ever formed in your mom's womb. How about that? You know, and, and think about this young kid um, it had to be intimidating, and we kind of we'll see in a minute from his response that I'm sure it was. But um, you know, God wanted him to know from the very beginning that his call went back even farther than his youth. Right? He was young. That his call, uh, that God had this plan in mind way before uh, he was ever existed in his mom's womb. God told him that you know what? I preordained this. This is my will. Now listen. You know, so I kind of understand the response that is given uh, by Jeremiah in in verse 6, because I'm not so sure I would come up with a different response. But, you know, it's interesting, like I said, um, before we get there, is, is how when he had this encounter with the Lord, you know, uh, his how powerful that had to been. It, it reminds me of Paul in Galatians chapter 1, where he talks about the same kind of thing, his calling. And he wrote in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, it says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the, God, among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. You know, he's saying that, you know, God separated him from his mother's womb for this purpose to to preach to the Gentiles. You know, isn't that interesting? Because, boy, the path that he took wasn't exactly, you know, a straight path from being born, you know, going directly into ministry. No, you know, I I mean, if anything, it was... uh, He took a very roundabout way. Yeah, I'll preach to the Gentiles, but I'm going to kill a lot of them first or persecute them, right? I I mean, uh, he kind of ran from it, but he realized once he had that personal encounter with the Lord, how he had been separated from, you know, from his birth, really, before his birth, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, it's interesting how when we come to know the Lord, when the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, how we can, 
with our spiritual eyes, look back and how God's uh, divine direction happened in our life, how, why he allowed us to do certain things. Well, certain things happened at the time. The last thing that we could were thinking of was the Lord and, and his plan for our lives. We were just trying to have a good time. We were just trying to do whatever it is. But once we come to know the Lord and we have that spiritual discernment, like Paul, even though Paul persecuted the church and he did all these things, he can say this, you know, that he was separated, uh, that God had separated him from before he was in his mother's womb and called him. Just as he's done each and every one of us here. You know, God has a call on our lives. Ain't that amazing to think about? But it also should be kind of scary, too. You know, if God has a call on our lives and he's had that call on our lives and has separated us for that call even before we existed in our mother's wombs, and if we're not fulfilling that, that's kind of a scary thought too, isn't it? You know, we need to make sure that um, we're taking care of our call. It, 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 you know, the thing about it too, and I love this in verse 6 because the thing about biblical characters is we see them with their warts and all. We see their, their mistakes. We see their, you know, their sinful behavior. We see their, you know, their faithfulness, whatever the case may be. But we see them for who they are, which I'm glad. Because if, if the Bible only reported all the good stuff, you know, all the good things they did, we'd probably, as human beings, want to elevate them up on a pedestal and say, oh, we could never attain that. But when we see that they had difficulties and they had their struggles and they had their lapses of faith and things, you know, we can relate to that, right? And, and we see that here. Look at Jeremiah's response to God's calling and saying, hey, I had this planned out that you would be a prophet. I foreordained it before you ever existed in your mom's womb. And look at uh, Jeremiah's response. He says, then I said, ah, Lord God, Behold, I can't speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. You know, he's saying, Lord, I'm young. I can't do this. Um, you know, uh, they're not going to listen to me. I'm too young for this job. Can't you find somebody more qualified? You know who's the most qualified for any job in ministry? The one who God called. It doesn't matter if they're two or 200. If God's called you, you're the most qualified. You might not have the most degrees or you might not be the most eloquent speaker or whatever, but, you know, uh, as the old kind of Christian adage goes, uh, God's not looking for our abilities. He's looking for our, our availability, you know, that, that we're there, that we're available to be used by God. And, and that's what we see here because God will use some stupid people I mean, the fact that I would be here, and he, he so much says that. And God can use anybody. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, he says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, uh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, that's me, to put the shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring nothing to the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So why would we? See, God chooses the foolish things of the world, right? He chooses the weak things of the world. Why? Because the foolish people of the world, me, the, you know, the, um, can't possibly take the glory from God. You know, it says so that no flesh can glory. God chooses the foolish things. God can use any of us regardless of what we've done in the past, uh, you know, what the world might think of us. Because I can tell you what, like I said, the most powerful person is the one that God's called. And I'll give an example. When I went to, um, when I, I was saved uh, under Greg Laurie at his church at Harvest Christian Fellowship, and there, there, um, the men's Bible study that would go on, there would be about 2,000 people, 2,000 men. And so when we would have these 
then the leader of the uh, men's ministry, he was this guy who was just on fire and anointed, but he was illiterate. He couldn't read. But even though he couldn't, he would struggle with reading some of the most simple words of the Bible. His discernment and wisdom and understanding of the Bible was just absolutely amazing. He couldn't pronounce half the words, but boy, did he know the Bible. That's because he was called to that. And he, you know, it, it was one of the most amazing things uh, I had ever seen that somebody, you know, like I said, um, where the world, he would have probably been the last person from a, a, a worldly perspective or a fleshly perspective, um, been chosen for that job, but he was the perfectly qualified one because God called them. You know, so don't, and we see it here too, you know, it doesn't matter what your station in life is, it doesn't matter your age, you could be young or old. You know, Paul said, uh, when he was told Timothy, he says, let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word and in conduct and in love and in spirit and faith and in purity. You know, he's saying, don't let anybody despise you because you're called just because you're young. But you know what? That same thing could be said, don't let anyone despise you because you're older. You know, don't let anybody despise you because you're this or you're that. No, if God's called you, it doesn't matter. God will uh, you know, God will be the one who gets the glory because let's be honest, God can use anybody or anything. And in the book of Numbers, he used the talking donkey, didn't he? You know, I mean, God, God is able, God is capable. And if he's called you to something and you know he's called you to that, then don't be afraid, be bold, you know, because God has ordained you. He set you apart from before you were ever born. And when we realize and we allow God to work in that way, and we understand the power of that, you know, it should bring us courage and boldness saying, you know what, God's called me to this, and I'm going to fulfill it. I don't care what anybody's opinion is. I don't care what the world says. If God's ordained me to do it, I know he's going to accomplish it through me. And so, you know, and like I said, that's a scary thought, too, if we are not actively fulfilling whatever the ministry that God's called us to. So that's kind of the, the, the first part of Jeremiah. You know, the, the first thing that I think we can take, um, you know, really counsel from this book is, is that be confident, not in your own abilities. Don't be confident in, you know, um, God has me as a, as a public speaker. Until... The time I was saved, I could barely speak to anybody in public. I was the shyest, and I'm still that way a lot of times out in public. I won't look anybody in the eyes. It's just, I've always been shy or whatever until I get to know you, and, and then it's different. But like talking to somebody one-on-one -on -one out in the public, it don't happen. I just kind of hide behind my wife, and she does all the talking. It, it's just the way it is. But but. You know, somebody like that who can't really even speak and who's really who grew up really shy as a kid and all that, God has me here. And he, he's equipped me to do it. And the funny thing is, it's, you know, I, I'm kind of reverse of everybody else. It's easier for me to speak in front of 2,500 people than it is to talk one on one to somebody. I'll, I'll much rather talk to 2,500 strangers than one stranger. I don't know. Most people have a fear of public speaking, but to me, it's easier than one-on-one. -on -one, my brain locks up and I'm like, okay, I don't even know what to say right now. I don't even know how to talk. How do you eat? What do you? Do? And I just sit there and overanalyze my own self. And then there's my wife next to me. And by the time we leave, she knows everything about them. She knows what medication they're on. She knows their, their prison history. She knows whatever the case may be. And me, I'm just like, I wouldn't even have got their name and you have the, her social security number. How do you do that? You know, it's, because that's not my calling. I'm, I'm not that person. But like I said, in, in a group of a bunch of people, it's easy for me, but just don't get me one on one. So once again, that's just God's calling. And, and like I said, he, he calls, he's called the foolish of the world. You know, I mean, I wouldn't be the one you would have picked out of speech class to be a pastor, you know, to be a public speaker. I would have been the last one. But that's the way God does, and thank God for it, because it's only through him that it's even possible. And 
he, he gets the glory because it definitely wasn't me or my, uh, or I had anything to do with it, that's for sure. So, you know, as we, as we think about that and we have a calling, you know, kind of the next verses that I kind of want to highlight are in chapter 7 uh, as we move on because we're already approaching 8 o'clock. Um, and I just wanted to look at a couple of verses here, in particular in chapter 7, verses 23 and 24. It says, but this is what I have commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk in the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they do not obey or incline their ears, but follow the, count, the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts, and went backwards and not forwards. You know, uh, this is, you know, think about it. It's what, he's saying, this is my command. It's pretty simple. Obey my voice. Do what I tell you to do, and things will go well. You know, why is that? You know, because we serve a loving God who knows the best for us, doesn't he? We serve a loving God who's telling us to obey, not, not because he is, you know, uh, loves to be a micromanaging dictator. No, he does it because he wants the very best for us. It's in our best interest to obey his voice. And he's saying, you know, uh, I don't care. Well, think about 1 Samuel 15, 22, you know, where, uh, where, it's a, where Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, uh, to obey is better than the sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. He's saying, you know what? All of the sacrifice and service doesn't mean a hill of beans if you're not obeying the Lord. He doesn't care about the sacrifice. He doesn't need your sacrifice. You can't, you know, uh, outspend the Lord or outgive the Lord, or you can't, you know, do all of these works and it mean a hill of beans to the Lord, because he could accomplish that through anybody. What he wants is our simple obedience. You know, obey the voice of the Lord. You know, that's what he wants. All the sacrifice and, and sometimes all of the stuff, it's really just smoke and mirrors, uh, you know, uh, to hide what's really going on inside. You know, all of the service, and we can do all of that, and we can do all of this ministry, but if we're not doing it with the right heart, if we're not obeying the voice of God, then it doesn't mean anything. And we need to make sure, you know, as it's saying here, that when we do obey the voice of the Lord, He blesses our life, doesn't He? You know, I, I use this example a lot. As kids, if we would have just simply obeyed the Lord, where it says, children, obey your parents, how many heartaches would that have saved us? If we would have just followed that one, you know, that one command, children, obey your parents, how much easier would life have been? You know, well, in most cases, because I think everybody here is a fairly good parent, right? But, you know, you know what I'm saying? Just think, I know how much heartache it would have saved me if I would have simply done that, children, obey your parents. You know, and that's just a simplistic example, but it's a good example of how if we would, if we would obey the Lord's voice, how much, how much more blessed and abundant our life could be. And God's warning Judah here saying, you know, just obey my voice and it'll go well with you. But the moment that you don't obey my voice, then you get yourself in the all kinds of trouble. You get yourself in the, you know, all kinds of issues, and then you want to blame me for it, you know? No, it's your poor choices. You didn't obey my voice. And, and, and that's what we see here. Um, you know, they didn't follow because, you know, a lot of times, and, and we'll see it addressed here in a minute, uh, when someone, and I've done this, when they don't want to really follow the voice of the Lord, they'll say, well, I'm following my heart. You are, you're following your heart. Oh, that sounds so lovely in like a Hallmark movie. That's great. You're following your heart. And, you know, it, 
and I'm following my feelings. And God kind of addresses that here in, in verse 24. It says, you didn't obey or incline your ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts and went backwards and not forwards. You know, they followed the dictates of their evil hearts. You know, in, in all these Hallmark movies and all these, you know, kind of Hollywood things, um, you know, it's like, oh, follow your heart. Your heart's never wrong. Yes, it is. It's always wrong. Don't follow your heart ever. It's, it's evil, as it says here, and it'll lead you backwards, farther away from the Lord, not getting closer to the Lord. And we see that here in Jeremiah, not only here, but of course, in a moment when we look at Jeremiah 17, in fact, if you want to turn there, turn to Jeremiah 17, you know, because uh, I, as a pastor, get that all the time. And they'll be like, well, you know, I just really feel like in my heart, this is what I need to do. Oh, this is what you feel in your heart. Wait, that same heart that Jeremiah the prophet said that the heart is deceitfully, uh, is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That heart, that's the one you're going to follow. That's what you want to follow? I don't know about you, but I don't want to follow my heart. I want to follow my calling, uh, you know, that, that God's given us. I want to follow God's word because I know it's not going to lead me astray. But that heart of mine will, if I allow it. Because, of course, the heart that it's talking about here in the Old Testament, it's not talking about you know, the thing that pumps blood, it's really talking about our inner being, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our, our mindset, right? And so as it's saying, uh, Jeremiah saying here, don't follow your heart. It's evil. It'll leave you backwards. It'll get you farther away from the Lord. Don't do it. And yet, of course, we see it all over the place. And um, you know, he, all throughout it, he kind of uses this as, as an example, you know, and Jeremiah 11, he said, Yet they do not obey or incline their ear, but everyone follows the dictates of their evil heart. Or in Jeremiah 14, 14, it says, The prophecies to you, a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. You see, are you starting to see Jeremiah's, you know, kind of uh, uh, idea of what the heart is? It doesn't sound as good as those Hallmark movies, does it? Or Jeremiah 16 says, each one follows the dictates of his own heart so that no one listens to me, speaking of God. You know, the last thing that we want to do is be led by our, our emotions, to be led by our feelings, uh, you know, because that's going to get us in trouble. We need to be led by the Spirit. We need to, uh, you know, be led by people who are, are godly, who are mature, that can give us wise counsel. Because as, as it says in Proverbs, you know, there's, there's safety in a multitude of counselors. The last thing we want to do is follow our emotions. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. But you know what? The good thing about it is, is uh, you know, God, and we'll, we'll see this um, here in a couple of weeks, God says, you know, if you accept me and if you're walking with me and if you're in the spirit, you know what? I'll take that evil heart and I'll replace it. You know, as he says in Ezekiel, he says that I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a and give you a heart of or take a a stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You know, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, uh, things have become new. I love that. See, we can have a new heart. We don't have to follow the dictates of that evil, um, you know, desperately sick heart that we once had. If we're in the spirit, if we're in fellowship, if we're doing those things that God, we're following our calling that he preordained us for, then we can have that heart of flesh. We can have that heart that is after God, that is in tune with his spirit, that is uh, following and obeying his voice. And man, that's powerful, isn't it? But we have to be doing the things God's ordained us to do. Yeah, we can buy the fire insurance, 
insurance to make sure we don't go to hell. And we can come here and set on Sunday or be one of those CEO Christians, you know, Chris, um, Christmas, Easter only Christians. Or we can, you know, but to be a really vibrant, on fire Christian, you know, we have to follow our calling because the one of the most miserable people I've ever met are those Christians that have a calling on their lives. They know they have a certain anointing and they run from it and they continue to run from it and God smacks them back around and they continue the cycle of just running from it instead of giving into it. But, you know, I don't know about you. Um, I get tired of running. I don't want to run, you know, um, and plus, the one thing that we know is that God only wants the best for us. And we see that in, in Jeremiah chapter 18. You can turn there, and I'm really giving you the abbreviated version at this point, but I don't want to keep you here all night. But Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6 say, says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the will. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look at the clay in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. I love this. We've all heard that old song, you know, you are the potter, I am the clay. Are we moldable? Are we allowing God to mold us into the image that he, that he desires us to be? Or are we, you know, trying to mold ourselves into the image that we think we want? Once again, it goes back to our calling. It goes back to our submission to God, to obeying his voice. Because it's not always easy sometimes to be molded by God into what he wants us. Because unfortunately, our will, our flesh, our, that old, you know, uh, evil heart of ours will try to get in the way and say, No, Lord, I know better than you the way I want to be molded. I'm going to be the potter and the clay, and so I'm going to do it my own way. Um, and it never works out very well, does it? But God's saying, allow me to mold you into the, in, into the image that I want you to be because I knew exactly what I wanted you to be before you were ever born. And it's beautiful and it's perfect and you can have peace and you can have joy and you can have meaning beyond, you can, um, beyond what you would ever otherwise know. Allow me to be the potter and you simply be the clay and allow me to do it. And you know, when we do that in this life, it takes the, the weight of the world off of us when we realize that God is in control and he's the one directing my life. I no longer have to strive. I no longer have to, you know, fight for these things, but instead we can give it over to God and say, well, you've ordained me to do this or that, and you're the one molding me into the ability to do it. So it's you, Lord. It's your responsibility. My life is in your hands. I'm going to quit struggling for it. You be the potter. I'll be the clay. And that's what God would have us to do, is it? And you know, the funny thing about it is, is although it, it sounds so simple and we can all sit here and shake our heads, when God starts molding us, a lot of times we fight against it. You know, um, if we just allowed God to do it, it would be so much easier. Like I said, there's so much more to life that we could get, so much more ministry that could be accomplished, that God could accomplish through us if we truly let him be the, the potter and us the clay. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that also through these chapters that I think it's important for us to get. You know, it's a theme that goes through this. And as... And it only makes sense that we would let God be the potter. Because if we truly believe God's word, then we also have to believe God's promises. And if we believe God's promises and we know 
from God's word what his character is. And we know that his character is immutable. It doesn't change. It's not like us where, you know, it changes over time or whatever, hopefully for the better. But God, God never changes. His character doesn't. His character is the same dealing with us as it was Adam or Moses or whatever. God doesn't change. And so when God tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of uh, welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope, we should believe that. And we should know that, that God has a future and a hope for us. And, and God knows his plans that he has for us. Of course he did, because he knew those plans before we were ever born. And if God knew those plans before we were ever born, and it's for us to have a future and a hope, which really in the Hebrew has an interesting um, a thought behind it. It's really that I would, um, how do I put it? Or, you know, that literally it means an end and a hope or a hopeful end is what it really means in, in the Hebrew, you know, um, those of us who are a child of God, those of us who uh, are Christians, we do have a hopeful end, don't we? We know, really, it's not an end in, in, in the one sense. We have eternity, and we have a, a future that is beyond this world, you know, right? Uh, we're just here. This is just kind of a training ground for, for where we're really intended to be. You know, and, and to think about that, that God thinks about us. God knows us and he ordained us and he thought about us before we were ever born. You know, David kind of, he said this in Psalm 40 verse 5, it says, your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You know, God loves us so much and he's not only ordained us with this future and a hope, but he thinks about us, those thoughts about us. We're his children. Wow. You know, that's a, that's, to me, that's just mind-blowing and crazy to think about. You know, Spurgeon put it this way, the Lord not only thinks of you, but towards you. His thoughts are, are all drifting your way. You know, and I thought that was kind of a powerful way of putting it. And, and, and I love that, you know, that he would give us a future and a hope. And regardless as this applies to Judah, you know, he was telling them, I have a future and a hope for you. You might be in captivity, but you're not always going to be in captivity. You have a future and a hope. We can be held captive here on this earth by sin, right? And all of these things, but God has a future and a hope for us. He has so much more for us. You know, he's, his thoughts are towards us. It never drifts. It's not like me where I can be thinking about something and six seconds later, I'm somewhere else, right? No, God's thoughts are always towards us. And he will deliver us just like he did uh, Judah out of captivity. No matter what our, or who our captives are, God has a future and a hope for each and every one of us. So to kind of wrap this up and to kind of wrap up uh, some of the application we have from the book of Jeremiah, it's just that one, God preordained the ministries that he's called us to, just like he did for, for Jeremiah. Not only has he preordained it, he's going to empower us to do them. Not only is he going to empower us, he's going to prosper us when we allow him to be the potter and we're molded into the image that he wants us to. But then also he has that, he's given us that future and a hope or that uh, hopeful end that we talked about. Because we do as Christians, I don't know how you could make it through this world and the tragedies and all the stuff that goes on uh, in this world without Jesus, without the hope of Christ. I don't know how you can make it. I can see why there are so many people committing suicide. I can see why there's so many people addicted and overdosing drugs. I can see why there's so much abuse in so many different ways. Because if you don't have that hope, what's it replaced with? It's replaced with despair. You know, so um, I'm just going to leave it there because we've way ran out of time. But if nothing else, we know 
that God thinks great thoughts towards us and that we do have a hopeful end and that's in Christ. But that only applies to us that are Christians, to those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you have not, uh, either here in the sanctuary or online, accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you don't have those same promises. You don't have that hopeful end, but you can. And it's simply just by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So if any of you need prayer, or if any of you would like to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come see one of us. If you're here in the sanctuary or if you're online, give us a call. We would love to talk to you more about it. So with that being said, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, just who you are. Lord, we thank you that you think uh, great thoughts towards us, Lord, and that you've preordained us um, you know, for ministry, Lord, to, to serve you. So God, I pray that you would help us to be those that, uh, like we talk so much about, that we'd allow you to be the potter and us to be the moldable clay, Lord. God, I pray that you would help us to obey your voice and follow you. So Lord, I just ask for those who are in the sanctuary here, that you would give them traveling mercies on the way home. And Lord, if there is some listening to this broadcast, either in person or online, Lord, that don't know you. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, just touch them, Lord, with your spirit, Lord, that they would see the need to come to know you and that they can have that desperation and that despair replaced with uh, the knowledge that you have a future and a hope for them. So Lord, we just thank you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Good night, guys.